Welcome back to the Recovery Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Miller. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and stroke survivor. Today, I want to talk about rationalization or what I'm going to call Rachelization. (laughs) It's the inner voice that justifies everything I want to do, no matter what the risk, and it's based on it seems like instant gratification. In my drinking days, I rationalized my drinking behaviors. I rationalized why I drank, you know, and it was either because I was really happy, because I was really sad, because I was really angry, you know. Um, And then after I was drinking, I rationalized why I did things. Um, I found excuses for why I did things. And this voice always had a good reason for everything. And just was masking the underlying issues and led me into denial about everything. I, you know, about my drinking. And uh, it, it made excuses for my drinking, my decisions, my lies, Um, my life, what ended up being my life that I had just driven into the ground financially, emotionally, I was just an absolute freaking emotional wreck. Um, I could feel my nerves jumping on the inside of me because I was so on edge at all times. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I'm not sure how much of it was anxiety and how much of it with, was withdrawal, but it was, uh, it was unbearable to be inside my skin, absolutely unbearable, unless I was drinking. And then um, physically, you know, that's, that's the physical side too, it was both of those together. And then, and mentally, I I was just a a mess, a a, a basket case. I can't even find the words to explain it. And it was just all about me continuing to make excuses. And, um, you know, I'll quit anything. I'll do anything but not quit drinking. Um, because that was the thing that I needed to quit and, and nothing else was going to work. So this episode is not just about the excuses I made, but understanding the deeper layer of control and manipulation that addiction wove into my life. And so rationalization was like, an ally to my disease. And it was a defense mechanism that protected me from accepting my addiction. And as I have been dealing with stroke recovery, you know, this, this two years between 2021 and 2023, where I was just in denial and not accepting that my life had changed because of my stroke, that I was never going to be the same. Um, I refused to accept that. And I just kept rationalizing the pain that I was feeling. It's, it's absurd. Um, I was rationalizing why I can keep work. I can keep working um, this way, you know, okay, well, that hurts. I'll try to do it this way, you know, and it just, there was, it just, uh, it, it was never going to happen. There was nothing that I could do. And so rationalization kept me from accepting the, the life altering impacts of my stroke. Um, And denial was the product of my rationalization, making me believe that I had everything under control. Um, When in reality, I was spiraling, 
spiraling. Sorry. <laughs> I'm my head hurts and I'm really tired. But um I'll talk about how wonderful my Christmas was when I get to the end of the episode. But um yeah, this this idea, this control thing, you know, as I have spent more years in sobriety, I have been able to recognize this level of control that I wanted to have in my marriage with my kid's dad. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's interesting how it has taken me so many years to see that. Um, because of course, a lot of times we get in these, these relationship relationships that, um, feel like we're in this just web of, you know, it was your fault. No, it was my fault. No, that was your fault. Um, and everything like over the years, just you know, ah, how do you say it? Like, it just becomes this complex web of anger and sadness and frustration and all of this stuff. And you can't really peel it back like an onion. You know, you can't really figure out what was at the core of it. Uh, because there's just all you can see anymore is the outside of the onion, you know, and that's what for a long time I saw my my marriage um, after we had divorced. I saw the outer core of that onion and what I saw was wrong with it. And as I've been able to peel back the onion um, in my sobriety, and then even more so finding so many more layers that I have to uncover, um, having this new challenge of stroke recovery, I'm, I'm learning so much more about myself. And I'm having even more clarity about how, you know, how I impacted my relationships up until this point in my life. And I'm 49 years old. So there's a lot of relationships I have impacted. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm taking ownership for both sides of these relationships. But I am um, more and more being able to see my side of the street so that I can clean it, you know, clean my side of the street. And, um, and it feels good, but it's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable to start peeling back those layers and see this idea of rationalization and how it played a giganto role in my life and this need for me to control everything, to control raising my kids, um, to control, uh, you know, that's why I wanted to be in the position that I was in at work as a marketing director, because I had to have some sort of layer of control to be happy. Um, I had to be able to have, to be at a level where I was, uh, my decisions were heard you know, my opinions, and I was able to make decisions, because that's just where I function in life. Um, And it's like everything I do. So to now be, you know, to be faced with sobriety, or needing to get sober, and to be faced with this debilitating pain in my head and not being able to use my eyes the way that I used to, um, I had to give up that, that control because I didn't have a choice. There was no way around it at this point. You know, when I, 
when I got to my job and I worked hard to get to that level where I could be an influencer, you know, be able to influence decisions and stuff like that, manipulate people, you know, I always used to tell my boss that I'm a manipulator. (laughs) But um, I've told some friends of mine that actually one of my employees, I said, yeah, what you don't know about me is I'm an extreme manipulator. And she's like, I don't believe that about you. I'm like, yeah, I am. I really am. So control and manipulation. Um, I don't think I manipulate in a way that I'm not a nice person, but I manipulate things in a way that keeps me in control of my environment. And at least that's my perspective on it. And in sobriety, when I made the decision that my life was unmanageable, I was continuing to fight myself and uh, try to just keep control. And I had lost it. I had lost control years before that. And yet I was still scratching, you know, to try to stay afloat. And, um, and really, I was just kind of falling, you know, I was falling, and I couldn't, I couldn't catch myself. And in stroke recovery, same thing. I just, um, for the past two years, I kept trying to control this pain and this inability to use my eyes and, and thinking that I was still in control and I just wasn't. I had lost control when I had my stroke. And, um, and, you know, just saying that, out loud today. That's that's why I do this podcast because it it gets me to say things out loud that I wouldn't have heard myself say otherwise. So, I lost control when I had my stroke. Yet I kept trying to uh, I I put on this like false this mask of control over the past two years. And, um, and it's painful to do that. It's uncomfortable to do that. It's more comfortable to, to honestly face something that's uncomfortable than it is to be kicking and scratching and remain in the discomfort of lies. If that, if that makes sense, it makes sense to me. Um, So breaking through this barrier of rationalization meant confronting some hard truths and facing reality. In sobriety, it meant peeling back the layers of all the lies I told myself and taking off all those masks I was wearing. All of the masks of the identity, the identities that I was trying to show other people. Um, In stroke recovery, breaking through rationalization meant that I needed to start grieving. I needed to accept that I lost control when I had that stroke. And I needed to start grieving for what I lost. Um, In both cases, and, and that's not a bad thing, that I was grieving for what I lost because without grieving, um, I was never going to heal. You know, I was never even going to start recovering until I accepted that things had changed inside of me, inside my head. And in both cases, accepting that life will be different for me forever. Not for a while, but forever. You know, when I, when I decided I'm an alcoholic and I need help, and then I went to detox, I came out of detox, I started drinking again, I wasn't accepting what was going on. Um, my daughter told me, it's okay to try again. I go back to detox, I get out. And I realize 
I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober. And at, at that point that I say I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stay sober, my life will be different forever. And that's difficult when you're supposed to be living one day at a time. And trying to distinguish between those two ideas and understand how that works, you really need somebody to talk to about it. You need a sponsor. You need to go to meetings. Um, trying to do it on your own, you know, it. some people can, but a lot of people can't. It seems to me like most people can't. They can probably put down a drink and not pick it back up, but being sober is not about just not picking up a drink. It's about being happy, you know, being able to not drink and still be happy and live your life and be free from that obsession. And the same thing for my stroke. When I, when I, you know, I still remember being on the computer and talking to the HR, my friend in, in HR at work and and I, we hung up. She had said, you really need to take care of yourself. And I got off and I walked outside and I sat down and started crying because I knew at that moment, again, my life was going to be different forever. I finally was just waving the white flag and saying, yeah, it happened. I had a stroke and it changed my life forever. And I wasn't willing to say that for two years. But this process, although it has been painful in both cases to be able to make that acknowledgement and to face the pain, it's, it's almost like, you know how... <laughs> I'm thinking of a memory, but you know how when you're standing at the top of a stairwell that leads down to a dark black basement and you're just like, Ugh! and I just got chills going up my back, actually. And you're thinking, yeah, it's fine to walk down those stairs, but what about walking up the stairs when the darkness is behind you and you just want to run? I used to, actually, the kid's dad, I challenged him to walk up the stairs from the basement with the basement being dark, like no lights on, walk up the stairs instead of running up the stairs. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He would squeal like a girl. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I taught myself to do it because I was tired of being scared of the darkness behind me. So I learned how to walk up the stairs and I've never run up the stairs since then. So try it. A little activity for the side. Try to, uh, yeah, walk up the stairs when the basement is, is dark. Anyway, my point was, it reminds me, like, turning and looking at reality and stop stopping rationalizing the uh, all of my behaviors and everything um, is like, looking down that stairwell at the dark basement and just walking down into it. Just walking down into it and starting to clean it out without turn the li turning the light on. That's what it, you know, or turn the light on and you get to see all the nasty stuff down there that you got to clean out. And um, it's painful to do that. But it has led me in both cases to a place of great clarity and honesty with myself. And then because I'm being honest with myself, I'm being honest with others. And that is such a relief. So today I'm grateful for the clarity, you know, through moments of Rachelization. <laughs> they still creep in, but I, I possess tools 
to notice it, that's a that's a challenge to just even notice it, first of all, and then confront it. And tools that tools for self reflection, um, being able to, you know, do this, the podcast or I journal so much. I journal so much. It's so helpful to me in my recovery. And um, it's a daily practice because uh, I have to challenge my old thought patterns. I lived 42 years of my life with those thought patterns. And I need to challenge them. It's only been, I'm 49, it's been seven years. That's it. So how do you change old thought patterns, 42 years of old thought patterns in seven years? It doesn't happen. So I have to do it daily. And I do try, I do do it daily. And some days I'm not as good at it as other days. And that's okay. Like, I totally love myself. I can do that. I didn't love myself seven years ago. I didn't, you know, I can't say I didn't love myself I felt sorry for myself. That's what it was. Like, I could, it's like I was outside of my own body and looking back at myself and being like, oh, you poor thing. (laughs) That's what it was like for me. And so every time that I'm doing this daily, I'm reaffirming my commitment to emotional sobriety. And I have to be emotional, emotionally sober to stay physically sober and stop making excuses to be right. You know, I don't have to be right. Um, I'm only harming myself. If I'm focused all the time on trying to be right, I'm usually just harming myself. And I need to quiet down and listen to others. And I'm really getting, I'm getting pretty good at that. Over the past six months, I think I'm getting pretty good at it. My stroke has been a humbling lesson to relinquish control. I had no choice and I still don't have a choice. Today, I felt like a lot of nausea Um, head discomfort, inability to focus my eyes. I had been feeling pretty good, um, but because I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing in recovery, which is staying away from all that stuff that hurts my head, but the kids, as I said yesterday, the kids came home to celebrate Christmas this morning and we had so many presents under the tree. We were opening presents to like two in the afternoon and it was so much fun. And when I get excited and those of you who know me pretty well, I get pretty excited. I'm kind of an excitable person. So, um, and my son's girlfriend is an excitable person too. So her and I together were like, clapping and (laughs) yelling and everything. It was just super fun. And when I get excited, my, I physically start to go downhill pretty quick. Um, because I mean, imagine like when you, when you're excited, you're like looking, your eyes are looking all around and, um, I'm, I don't know, but, uh, I felt like shit, (laughs) which is say I felt like shit. Um, and so, when I feel like that, I really know that I need to settle down. And when I feel like that, I start leaning into other people. Um, emotionally, I start leaning into, I let people give me advice on what I need to do. You know, like maybe you should go lay down why don't you just sit back while, uh, like my son said, why don't you sit back while I clean up the, um, the wrapping paper? I was the trash girl. You know, you have to have a trash girl when you're opening presents. (laughs) So I was taking the trash and he was like, why don't you just sit back and I'll do it. Um, and I let that happen. And because of this control thing that I've always had, 
Um, I didn't used to do that. I used to be like, no, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. Everything. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Everything. All the time. I'll do it. And, um, and I try, I have to try really hard to relax and let other people do it. Um, so the experience has, has been a lesson that I never would have learned otherwise, that sometimes letting go of control is the most empowering thing that I can do for myself. So today I'm reminded to confront these inner voices of rationalization that sometimes are so sneaky quiet I don't even know what's happening. But not just recognize when I'm bending the truth to myself, but understand that deeper need I have for control. And I've always had it. And learning how to let go. Um, it's about feeding my future self with honesty, acceptance, and love. Um, and I need that right now. I need it. Um, I need a lot of it. So thank you for joining today for a little introspection. S tomorrow, stay tuned because I'm going to provide a sneak peek into season two of Recovery Daily Podcast. And season two starts January 1st because I'm an overachiever. So season two has to be way better than season one. So hopefully uh, you'll want to get involved. It's going to be super fun. Um, but I did want to share a little bit about our Christmas, our Christmas presents, because that's so fun. And so for Christmas, you guys will enjoy this, I think, because you've been listening to the podcast for so long and know what all my interests are right now. So my boyfriend gave me an ice cream maker that hooks to my KitchenAid uh, stand mixer. Um, and I usually have ice cream uh, every night before bed. I haven't been doing that as much um, because I've been drinking a Coke usually when I'm recording my podcast. But um, anyway, you know, I got to have sugar in some, some way or another. And then he also gave me a sifter, like a scale and sifter that also hooks to the KitchenAid. So I'm excited to use that for my breads and all of my baking. And then uh, speaking of Cokes, my daughter's boyfriend gave me a two liter bottle of Coke. Uh huh. And uh, my daughter, this is so creative, gave me um, like 25 podcast episodes that she recorded of herself talking about real stuff in her life. And she also interviewed with my son and his girlfriend. And she interviewed with her boyfriend. And she's like, so that was so amazing. I haven't listened to any yet. But um, that's going to be super fun. And then my son gave me an awesome gnome, a solar gnome that goes in my garden that I love that has little flowers all over its hat. And then my son's girlfriend, get this, gave me um, a hat, a bag, a coffee cup, and a fleece that all have the Recovery Daily logo on it. And I bawled my eyes out. It was just like this release that it was like the perfect ending to my year, to have that kind of all of my family was sitting with me. And I opened like the it felt like the pinnacle of the entire experience, you know, to open this up and be like, you created this from what you're going through, you created it and to actually hold it in my hands was just 
incredibly meaningful to me um, because I just sit here in my closet every night and talk to myself in, into the microphone. You know, I used to do it in my office. Now I sit in the closet. It's kind of cozy in here. I'm not going to lie. So uh, to actually be able to hold all of this stuff that had the logo on it, I just, I, I was sobbing, like sobbing, crying. So it was super meaningful for me. And I'm going to post a picture of them on, on, of all the merch I got on Facebook. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, the merch will be available for you to buy if you're interested. We'll see. Um, I'll poll. I'll do a poll and you guys can tell me if you're interested in getting some Recovery Daily merch with a with a little brain logo on it or something. So I will see you back here tomorrow to find out what's coming new in Season 2, 2024. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you.